Hello and welcome to Inside the Gun, a new series produced by the Gun Gallery. In this series, we will have several episodes in which we highlight a work from the Gun Gallery collection. And we'll learn a bit about this work through the lens of our professors. Um, my, my name is Jody Kovach. I'm your host. I'm the Curator of Academic Programs at the Gun Gallery. And our guest today is Associate Professor of Drama, Anton Dudley. Thank you for joining us today, Anton. Thanks for having me. And the work that we're going to highlight from the collection and the topic of our discussion is Jacob Lawrence's A Builder's Family. It's a gouache on board painting from 1993. And this was a gift to the collection from um, David Horvitz and his wife, Frances Bishop Good. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about this painting and about the artist Jacob Lawrence. He is an important artist of the 20th century. Um, he is really distinguished for his series, um, the narrative series that he created about the African-American experience, um, history of African-Americans in the United States, and also their role in building modern US society. This is from his Builder series. Um, it's a theme that he worked with through much of his career that spanned most of the 20th century. As I mentioned, this is from 1993, so this is a late work. And he's really developed this theme and what it meant to his larger um, career, his, his practice in um, narrating stories about the African-American experience that show us their role in actually building, um, literally, modern society in the United States. He's also known for his very distinctive modernist style. So you'll notice he worked in primary colors, mostly. His compositions are um, spatially somewhat fragmented and distorted. Uh, we notice like a flat articulation of space and areas with some illusionistic perspective too. His figures are very uh, geometric, um, constructed of circles and rectangles, kind of blocky, fragmented forms. And for this, we think that he was drawing from synthetic cubism and also the work of other American modernists like Stuart Davis. But really, Jacob Lawrence's style is very distinctive, and his figures are strong and monumental. And the theme of building was very important to him because he saw that working and building was a way of uh, liberation for African Americans. So let's talk more about this with Professor Dudley and uh, see it through the lens of his perspective as a drama professor and just also his personal appreciation for this work of art. I know when Professor Dudley um, Anton first came to Kenyon and we looked through the gallery together, he was very excited that we had a Jacob Lawrence painting in the collection. So Anton, can you tell us what drew you to this work? Yeah, sure. So, um, so I uh, I teach directing uh, in the drama department. So I want to sort of look at this through two ways that really excite me. So one of that is um, sort of composition and picturization. Sort of talking about how the perspective is created in the picture, um, and then the other is the sort of uh, narrative of it, or where my mind goes with the illusions that it makes. Um, and I should say that I, was, uh, I came to Kenyon from living in New York City for a long time, and uh, MoMA has uh, a wonderful collection of Jacob Lawrence, and so when I saw this, I was like, ah, I really want to work there. They have a Jacob Lawrence. This is very exciting. He's one of my favorites. Um, so the first thing, when I look at this, um, I, I really believe that uh, you know part of the director's job in theater is to uh, create the physical manifestation of what the story is through picture. Um, so in film, the camera can sort of go and guide our eye because we are looking through the eyes of the camera. Um, but on the stage, we're sitting there looking at the whole stage the entire time, and you can't really guide where, uh, or it, it seems as if you can't really guide where the audience's eye is going at any moment. But of course you can in the way that uh, painters have been doing for centuries. Um, and this is sort of how the perspective happens. So I, I, I look at this picture, um, and of course the red catches my eye, um, as Jody talked about these primary colors. And so you've got level, 
you've got mass or the sh sort of shape and how it's how it's collected in the picture, and you've also got color. Um, so the first thing I see is this red, which catches my eye, right? And that sort of shoots me up um, in this lovely uh, vertical line that we have here um, to the mother's eyes. Now, of course, the eyes are not only the windows to the soul, but they're also what the soul is looking at, right? And when we see somebody's eyes, not only are we sort of looking into their personality, but we're also wondering what they're looking at. So if I suddenly went like that, right, and we'd all probably look up there. Um, so I see this red, it catches me, it sends me up this vertical line to her eyes, which then drops me down to the center. And there's this other great, beautiful uh, yellow color here that's bright that captures my eye in the middle of that blue um, tablecloth there. Uh, then there's another wonderful vertical line that sends my eye up here. And then there's this beautiful sort of brown uh, uh, rug cut into the, the yellow floor here. Um, and that relates to sort of the heads of these two uh, children at the table. So we create this kind of pattern going down here. And then of course I follow that arm here. The arm keeps taking me to the saw, which then there's another arm that takes me up to this child. Um, and then of course I come back down uh, to this yellow centerpiece where the food is. And so I love this because actually from there then the red catches my eye and there's just this constant cycle that's feeding me through this family and this activity that they're going on. Now, of course, what's also wonderful, if you look at these lines, there's another sort of forced perspective here that in many ways what we have is, if you think about where you would be standing in this room to look at this family, you know, you're here and you're looking back into the room, but everything's sort of pushing us up, right? And so there's all these vertical lines. There's this sort of triangle that's formed with the children, there's a triangle that's formed with the table. Um, there's a triangle that's formed with the children and the mother. Again, her head is tilted. So all of this is feeding up to those windows. Um, and to sort of riff off what Jody said, uh, you know, this city that we see, this emerging city out here, um, is in direct responsibility to the labor of this family. Um, and there's something sort of aspirational about that city. Um, with, with the light coming in there, and it's sort of this lighter blue color, um, but also this idea of this, this family as the foundation of that city. And all of this is done through the perspective. I mean, I could probably say I have no idea what this painting is about, but when I look at it, these lines, these masses, these movements sort of direct me to that. Um, the other thing that I find so profoundly moving about this painting is the illusions uh, that it makes. So. What I think is interesting is this family is flanked on either side by tools, right? So we've got these very, the saw, uh, the chisel, the hammer um, here, um, and then we've got other tools up here, the saw, the hammer, again, uh, these sort of measuring tools um, on either side of them. And then, so then they land here uh, in the center of these two tools. They're surrounded by the tools, they're flanked by them, and we have them eating. Um, and if you can see how they're eating, it's it's very uh, it's very proprietary over <laughs> the food, right? There's a lot of guzzling. It looks like the heads are turned down and the arms are going like this. Um, and so they're very hungry, right? They've been working, and sort of this is this is the treat, and they're sort of grabbing that food in this moment. But if you take a closer look at that, what we see. The mother's standing over them. She's got this wonderful piece of fabric draped. It's almost like a waiter, right? Or like a server in a restaurant. Um, and then if we go further, that line, again, another vertical, takes us to this spoon that takes me up to this, um, what looks like a milk jug. And of course, that's beautifully placed under her breast. And so there's something very maternal about this nourishment that she's giving her family. If we follow that along, um, her left breast is highlighted and the arm is underneath it and there's the other arm there and it's almost like she's holding her baby um, and, and breastfeeding or nursing the baby, right? Um, and so she's looking over this, it's almost like a pieta um, a, a pose from a, a classical art, right? Um, so there's a, a religious reference there too, um, which I find really lovely because it's asking us in this painting that seems about labor to sort of find the divinity um, in this body of color, which I think is especially profoundly moving um, at this moment in history as well, and sort of ask us to find divinity in all people. Um, 
And so she looks over them as this sort of divine mother with this nourishment of milk, right? With this sort of um, taking care of them in this many way. And then we come down, um, and what I love is when you see how they're eating and what they're eating, I'm always sort of struck by this child looks left-handed to me, uh, because if we can see, um, everyone else is using their right hand to use their spoon, and that child is using the left. Um, and what I love is there's this profound sense that when you first look at them, there's a unity, right? And then you realize that one of them is different. And so she's treating all of her children as equal, um, even though there is difference among them. And I find that um, really profoundly moving. Uh, there's also uh, bananas on the table, which I find really interesting because um, this is a very mechanical, very urban uh, uh, picture. We can't really see what the other what the other food is they're eating. Um, it looks like bread, but there seems to, there's definitely bananas, and then there seems to be some sort of fruit there. Um, and so I think about also the other types of labor that have built our country, um, plantations that are also built um, on the backs of um, you know people who share uh, uh, an ethnic or racial culture with this family here. Um, so I find that really interesting, bringing all those narratives into this painting. And then the one last thing I sort of want to remark, which I love too, is we've talked about sort of how this family becomes the foundation for this city or this society outside the window, um, both perhaps through their labor and through these allusions to uh, plantation uh, work. But also, if you look at the um, buildings outside the window, they're stairs, right? Um, and there's something I feel that this work um, is going to help uh, them ascend this city, that they will sort of be able to step up, right? Um, and I think that's a real sort of, uh, you know, immigrant narrative as well, right? This sort of head down doing the labor and, and you will ascend. Um, so I, I find that hopeful uh, outside the window, this, this light, um, you could sort of see this as smoggy, but it's, it's, a, it's a lighter blue color. And I think that it's, it isn't just we have built this city that's oppressing us, it's we've done this labor and there is some hope there that we can also um, ascend this work, that, uh, ascend through this work that we have given this city. So um, there's a lot of hope and love in this picture, um, even though there's also a lot of exhaustion and hunger as well. <laughs> Anton, thank you so much for that very thoughtful reading of this painting. I think that everything you described illuminates something that Jacob Lawrence said about his work, which was um, that the relationship between form and content was essential, that it was a shared relationship. One did not uh, take priority over the other. And the way you describe the space and, and the formal elements, the colors, the shapes, it, it really brings to light how Jacob Lawrence built this composition and wanted to make the viewer, I think, see this as a built environment as a way. It's constructed um, it as a very physical kind of concrete presence to it. Even, even the opaque quality of the gouache paint lends itself to that that sensibility. And I think too, what you just said about the city beyond the stair step, the, um, I, I think that Jacob Lawrence was thinking very carefully about how even um, just the shapes of things, the directional lines were uh, conveying something about the story that's taking place here. Um, even the tools, the tools are a little bit larger than they should be in relationship to the scale of the figures. He really wanted to emphasize the importance of these as building um, materials, as things that enable, if used properly, to um, improve, to, to create, to, um, to develop a, a, a work ethic, a relationship to one another, a community. All of these things come together through the act of working and building. And then I, I love what you remarked upon about the, the mother figure. And the female figure, the maternal figure, was also something that we see as a late motif in Jacob Lawrence's work. He did a series on Harriet Tubman, for example, 
in which she takes on a, um, a, a maternal presence that is often seems akin to what you described here is um, uh, the Virgin Mary as, as a, a sort of religious figure. And she also is portrayed as the provider, as, as really the rock of, of, of the family, of modern society. He's always creating these correspondences between um, the African-American family, um, life, work ethic, important historical figures, and progress. And so I, I think too, it, you, you pointed out such um, important nuances in her figure, the way she's holding the, the, um, the jar, um, the angle of her arm, um, her pose. And I'm wondering if you can talk also about the monumentality of her figure. Um, it seems contrary to, ideas of beauty um, in, in the female form that we see in the history of art. Um, and even the, ch the children here seated around the table, one thing that students often ask me is why are their faces, why do they look like skulls? Why, um, this one even has some sort of frightening uh, teeth that <laughs> he's burying there. Um, what do you think uh, maybe guided his choices here, or, or how do you interpret that? Well, um, I think those are great questions, and uh, uh, can I also just say, since you were talking about the tools, one thing I, I just wanted to say before I answer that, um, is I'm struck also how all these tools are hand tools. Um, and I will be honest, uh, being a, 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 an appreciator um, of, of art, but not a scholar of it, uh, of, of painting. Um, I always thought Jacob Lawrence was painting in an earlier time period than he was. Um, and I look at this and I think, it's so amazing that these are all hand tools, yet you're seeing this urban environment that we take for granted now is built with you know cranes and uh, mechanics and all this stuff. And I think it's important to be reminded that regardless, I had a friend who said, Oh, um, you know, we're also obsessed with, with finding handmade objects now. And he said, you know, that an Apple laptop is a handmade object. And I was like, oh, right, that's a very important thing to remember, right? Um, so that, you know, this city that looks so um, uh, of the industrial age, so mechanized, right, is actually built by hand by people, regardless of what tools they're using. Um, but yeah, to say about the mother, I mean, I. I I hear what you're saying, uh, Judy. I, I guess I find her so beautiful because to me, um, I'm a lover of fairy tales. And I think, um, you know, in the 20th century, fairy tales have been really uh, diminished um, uh, because we have sort of a, a, a kind of binary relationship to them rather than a complex sort of dualistic relationship to them. Um, and I think if you look at most sort of fairy tales, they never actually describe how someone looks. They just say they were beautiful. Um, and I think having grown up on Walt Disney movies, we sort of have the idea of what we're told that means when we read in the fairy tale, this character is beautiful. Um, but there's there are very few descriptions, uh, if any, of, of what that is. In, in if you look at Grimm and sort of older fairy tales uh, uh, that have been collected and recorded by these people. Um, and so I think what that reveals to me in fairy tales is that good people look beautiful and bad people look ugly. Um, and it's only sort of when we took that out of text and had to put it into image where the artist had to define what beauty and ugly was. Um, and of course, you know, when this was happening on a commercial scale in the 20th century with film, there were certain choices that made that excluded others. Um, but I look at this and for me, I, I, there's so much beauty um, and grace in her. And I think, uh, you know, at the risk of offending some, I will say part of that comes from her maternity, right? Um, but it also uh, comes, I don't want to say also, because it comes from her strength, and I think maternity is a, is a, <laughs> a great measure of strength, shall we say. Um, so there's an enormous amount of power and grace sort of married in her form, which to me sort of is what a maternal image is. Um, I love that in this sort of uh, labor's home, she seems to have actually this incredibly couture red gown on. I mean, Valentino could have, you know, designed this. There's this strange sort of highlighting that it seems to sort of 
you know, wisp behind her. Um, uh, and, and I just feel that that's coming from within. Um, her skin has so many warm shades um, that, that seem to emanate a, a, a glow, which I find really um, attractive. And of course, uh, the, the juxtaposition of lines and curves in her, I think, again, shows sort of the grace and the strength. Now, um, and I think, you know, it seems to me like this is a matriarchal culture that really respects her and she is, she's both able to protect, um, uh, uh, you know, and inspire in this culture. Um, and then I look down at the, the children and yeah, I was really struck by that, but uh, as you say, that they do look like skulls. I mean, essentially the jawbone, the teeth, the eye sockets, um, the lack of, of hair, there's a very sort of rounded um, scalp and, and the decision to put these two definitely in profile, right? The, the clarity of that. Um, I could get model in and say what that means for me, but um, especially with recent events on my mind in this country, but um, I, I think there, there's sort of two ways to look at it. There's sort of the, the sadness of, um, you know, we are, we are born to die, right? And children often um, seem to us as rebirth or new hope or newness or a sort of immortality, you know? Um, they are innocent and we become innocent when we look at them and, and believe in things like immortality, <laughs> um, but that they too are mortal. Um, uh, they seem so young in scale compared to her, um, but we assume that these tools are theirs uh, I, I, I don't see it as she's this one man band who labors and does this. I'm sure she's a part of that, but these definitely, there's too many tools for one person. Um, so this feels uh, definitely like they are laboring. Um, so I, uh, and I don't know what their age is. They seem young, but who knows? Um, she might be elevated by her position as mother. One of these, you know, could be an adult for all I know. Um, and then I also think there's, uh, an allusion to ancestry, um, which I think is very important. And for me, that sort of also comes with the sort of uh, elements of plantation um, uh, that I see, um, that they have come from somewhere, um, that they are, you know, here on the foundation of their past. Not only is this here on the foundation of their present and their past, but they are here on the foundation of their past. Um, and that they are locked into their ancestors um, through these skulls. You know, some cultures have bone worship in the way that, you know, our culture, we might see them as death, you know, uh, or, or you see it as poison, right, or toxic, or pirates, or these negative things. Um, you know, other people, bones are uh, like a psychopomp is the way to get from our world to the spirit world or to the ancestral world. Um, just because I, I find so much life and so much hope um, and so much radiance in this picture that I do think it's dualistic if there are those images that, that make us think of things that we find negative or off-putting um, or sad. I, I, that doesn't feel to me like the defining image of, of the painting. Um, so I think both of those are being balanced in a way, if that makes sense. I think so, definitely. I think that, that work has uh, an ambivalence in his work their, uh, his, his characters and their relationship to work has, it, it retains that history of slavery and forced labor, but taking ownership of that and, um, and transforming work into something that, that liberates African American people is, um, is something that is, is, gives this painting a transcendent quality to it, I think. I, I really appreciate that the things that you said and the insight that you offered here. I think that was a beautiful interpretation. Thank so thank you. I just have one more question for you. And then I'd love to hear anything else you have to add. But um, my, my role here at Kenyon is to work with the faculty and, and Anton is one of my, my best collaborators and most brilliant and, and inventive, for sure. And we've had a, a lot of opportunities to work together to um, integrate the artwork in the gallery into his teaching. And you've done that in a number of different ways. What possibilities do you see for this painting? Um, 
Well, yeah, so along with directing, I also teach uh, dramatic literature and writing uh, lyrics for musical theater. And I look at this, and this feels to me to be so musical. Um, it definitely has a rhythm in it. Um, it has a sound in it. There's a, there's a movement in it. There's a narrative in it, all these things that are essential. Um, uh, the, the brightness is also entertaining. Um, there's process in it. There's things that are happening. So all these things are sort of essential to the song. Um, so, you know, one, the first thing that comes to my mind is I, I would love uh, to ask a student to turn this into a song. Um, choose who is singing. Is it a group number? Is it one of these voices? Um, are they singing to someone in the picture? Are they, uh, are, is, it, is it a thought of this character singing? Um, do the tools start singing underneath? Um, there's, uh, I, I think of the wonderful um, Janine Tesori, Tony Krishna musical Caroline or Change, where the opening number, uh, Caroline, who's a domestic worker in somebody's house, um, has a song where the washer, the washing machine and the dryer start singing to her in the laundry room. Um, you know, is there a bird that flies by this window and sees this family and what do they notice about this family? So there, there's that. I think for um, a directing course, what's interesting is if you had to animate this picture, um, you know, do that in sort of a, a silent scene, a staged scene and say, what is the rhythm? What is the pace of this? Is, the, it, is this moving mechanically as they eat? Is it fast? Is it slow? Um, oftentimes I talk about there's a character that defines the rhythm of the scene and then other characters either participate in that rhythm or they come in contrast to it to create conflict. So if you decide who's the protagonist of the scene, is it the children or is it the mother? Um, and this is where that musicality comes in too, is the mother sort of have this kind of slower um, a more graceful rhythm and the children have this more mechanical rhythm um, or is it the inverse of that and then which is the rhythm of the painting and which is coming into conflict with that um, you know I think there's there's so much as I said movement in here so the opportunities for playing with staging um, and when we look at staging and directing we also talk about the things that I've talked about here uh, line level mass um, and how those can help tell stories so I think if you put this in three dimensions where would our eye go? How would our eye travel? And it uses those same rules of eye line, verticality, you know, mass here, triangles are very important in directing. So those are the first two things that sort of uh, uh, come to my mind um, and how I might use this. Um, of course, there's amazing elements. For, I don't teach design, but being in theater, if you were a director collaborating with designers, how do you achieve this light? You know, what would a three-dimensional space look like if you painted it this way and did the costumes this way? I mean, that would be remarkable uh, for a piece of theater. Um, do you, if this was a scene, would you shave the actors' heads or would you build these great kind of paper mache or prosthetic um, heads? Uh, and how would that inform the style of, of the scene and the speech that you were creating and to what, to what effect on the audience? Great ideas. <laughs> Well, we'll keep those in mind for the future. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and we can all come back to campus, hopefully soon. Yes. Anton, thank you so much for bringing this being team to life for us. This has been illuminating for me and I'm sure for our audiences as well. Thank you. So. Well, I learned so much from you always as well. So <laughs> it's great to collaborate with Jacob Lawrence. How many times do you get to do that? That's amazing. So thank you. <laughs> and thanks to our audiences for joining us today. Uh, follow our website for future episodes. Uh, special thanks today to Director of Digital Content and Engagement, Caroline Colbert, who's coordinated the recording of this session and is responsible for producing it. Also special thanks to Robin Goodman, our collections manager, for making this work available to us today. We'll see you next time on Inside the Gun.